thank you for coming. Um, it is really an honor for me to be here with the three of you and with everyone else who, who's joining us. Um, let's start off with why we're here. Uh, so really what this is about uh, is trying to come together at the beginning of the school year, uh, which maybe it's not so close to the beginning at this point, it's now a month in, but it really is, we're still trying to figure out what it looks like coming back to campuses across this country in the time of COVID. Uh, and it was really important to figure out how to connect with others, not just on our campuses, but across campuses um, to figure out what are they doing well, what works at those campuses, what are, what should we be sharing across our campuses, uh, what can we be learning from each other, what works locally in one place, but may not work locally in another place, let's get this conversation started. Um, there's the three people that we have here today. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves, but I wanted to give some context as to why uh, the three of you are, are being represented. I'll put in the chat again uh, the, the documents, the papers, but during this time when I had a lot of time to read, here is the link to that. Um, I have found a lot of things that were coming out online that were, that were really important. One was a report from the um, National Academies on the state of sustainability education um, and sort of summarizing the big important ahas from across this country. The, uh, and this was, and Chris Boone was, a, was an author on this and it was one of the people steerheading this uh, publication. I read Pam's book, uh, Pursuing Sustainability, which is as I said, probably the closest thing I've ever seen is like a textbook uh, for something that's very interdisciplinary like this, um, that could probably be used in any given department. Uh, and that had frameworks and case studies that were really widely um, applicable. Uh, and the third thing I saw was that Carnegie Mellon uh, had done this university-wide um, assessment uh, trying to get a bird's eye view of all the work being done in education, in research, uh, and in convenings, and tagging it to the SDGs so that they could get a sense of what is the scope of work being done across the university. And I just thought these three, um, uh, these three things were so compelling that I reached out to all three <laughs> and said, can we, can we please all get together? So thank you for, for indulging me. Um, I will be the moderator for this, but I will also be uh, representing MIT uh, and trying to explain uh, what's being done here, what I see is the most compelling work and, and thinking about how is it that we should be learning from one another. So um, Chris, would you like to start just to introduce yourself? Sure, and thanks again, Sarah, for the invitation to uh, come and have this conversation with all of you. My name is Chris Boone. I'm the Dean of the College of Global Futures. It's the newest college at Arizona State University and a professor in the School of Sustainability. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for, uh, for putting this together and inviting me to participate. I'm Pam Matson. I'm from Stanford University, a professor in the Department of Earth System Science and uh, a senior fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment. Um, and also the director of our sustainability science and practice uh, program in our change leadership for sustainability uh, program. And um, I've, um, I've, I've, I've worked in interdisciplinary um, sort of solutions oriented research and, and agriculture. And uh, I've also been involved in, in helping develop and teach in a number of educational programs around sustainability. And I've also been an institutional leader like Chris. Uh, I was a dean of the School of Earth for uh, 15 years, and I'm really interested in how universities um, structure themselves and arrange themselves so that we can engage in this, this cross-disciplinary, um, you know, solutions-oriented research. Thank you. Uh, Alex? Sure. My name is Alex Hitnicker, and I am Carnegie Mellon University's Executive Fellow for the Sustainability Initiative. 
which was established by our provost in September 2019 to align our education, research, and practice activities with the broader 21st understanding of, the, of sustainability, which is represented by the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm new to higher education. I joined just over a year and a half ago, um, but I'm not new to sustainability. Previously, I oversaw New York City's Global Goals Program, and before that, I spent about 15 years working in international development and implementing programs in around 20 countries around the world. And I'm really excited to be here. Um, I thank you so much, Sarah, for convening this, not just this, but the overall speaker series, which I know there are more exciting events coming up. And I look forward to a conversation about sustainability and education. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So before we start, I wanted to provide a, a little another frame for us, which is um, one of the things that we've talked about is that sustainability education is really sort of a spectrum of people that we, we try to reach. At one end of the spectrum, we sort of have the people who are already very interested in this. They're sort of already the members of the choir. This is what they want to study. They want to go into this for their life work. And then at the other end of the spectrum is just like mainstream uh, Americans uh, and students who are not necessarily, um, or they may be aware of it, but they're not into it. Uh, and yet it still has to be part of the way that they that they do their work when they go out in the world. And so how do we reach people across that spectrum is one thing we're going to think about. Um, that uh, sustainability education, there's really a diverse, um, you know, array of approaches to do this and that there are no fixed models, uh, despite the fact that this is being done all over the country, there's really no one way to do this. Um, and that we're really learning as we go, yeah, much like COVID. Oh. We lost the, there we go. Um, much like COVID, we're learning as we go and we're, and we're figuring this out. And this is part of the reason why it's really important to, to share with one another. Um, uh, and I will be uh, asking prompts and questions and sort of ask, I will be both moderator and representing MIT in this, in this uh, conversation. Um, and I have a couple of questions and I wanted to start with, um, what are the most important stories or frameworks or models or mental models that drive growth at your university? And Pam, I will start with you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, well, I, I tend to think about sustainability research and education in universities as a very big tent. So exactly as you say, there's a, you know, there's lots of different disciplines, lots of different kinds of people and approaches to addressing sustainability challenges to, you know, helping find solutions. And uh, definitely not one size fits all and definitely um, different kinds of, um, uh, of educational systems are important across the board. And, and so I think the big challenge is figuring out what's, what are the basics that we wish everybody knew, no matter where they're at. And then, you know, for those who are, you know, for the different kinds of communities, what's the right kind of educational program. And, and at Stanford, we've, we've sort of experimented across the board on this, starting from one end of your spectrum, you know, where how do you reach everybody in the university and beyond? And, you know, we've tried a variety of things. Like, for example, um, for many years, we had Thinking Matters courses at Stanford that every freshman was required to take. And we had a sustainability Thinking Matters course. And the whole idea here was, to get freshmen as they're coming into the university to realize that this is not about getting the right answer in this course. This is about thinking it through. Great place to be able to teach things like complex social environmental systems and, and develop frameworks for dealing with sustainability challenges. So, but that's for everybody. Everybody can benefit from that no matter what they do. And then we have you know, other programs that are already established. What can we add? to them. They're already in great program solutions oriented. What can we add to them? How can we evolve them to, uh, to really prepare the students who are leaving to be sustainability leaders? And then we have examples that I'd love to tell you about, but I'll wait, <laughs> but uh, uh, really specific examples where we built from the bottom up through using very careful design processes, programs, educational programs that are um, intended to basically train leaders of the next generation, you know? So um, we, we go with this whole range, lots of other things in between, um, certification or minors or service learning courses. And um, 
I took to me, this is the approach is almost it's just a continuing experiment. Um, huh. We learn what works. We try to evaluate. I'd love to hear more from Chris on evaluation. And, um, and we, and we keep evolving as the challenges of sustainability evolve. But I, I'll, I'll give you specifics later, but I, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Chris. Uh, Alex, are you okay? Are you still there? Oh, we're waiting to hear from Alex or yeah. retrieving Alex. Uh, let me make a few comments. So I agree entirely with what Pam just said, and that's been part of the design principles for how we've engaged sustainability here at Arizona State University and with partners around the world uh, for a very simple reason. And that is uh, when you're trying to reach the goals of sustainability, uh, you need everyone. <clears throat> you need all forms of expertise. Um, and secondly, because we need to be able to scale these ideas to match the magnitude of the challenges and the opportunities that we're facing. So for instance, if we trained only a small segment of our population in sustainability, we wouldn't simply have the number of people that are necessary to meet the challenges that are global in scale. So the way that we've approached sustainability education at our own institution is similar to what Pam just described, is a big tent approach. We need to allow anyone, no matter what their interests are, to have some means of engaging in sustainability thinking or sustainability framing. I mean, it's almost like learning mathematics or, or writing. I mean, these are really fundamental skills. And what we're trying to represent with the way that we're approaching sustainability, it's also a fundamental skill. So the, the elements of sustainability as both a systems thinking approach to understanding our interactions with planetary and biophysical systems, but also thinking about how we can use that knowledge to design intervention solutions to lead to the, a better future and a necessary future. Those are skills that we need uh, regardless of what people are doing in terms of their careers or their study paths. It's, it's gotta be an all in mission, I think, if we're really going to be successful. So I will talk a little bit about MIT. Oh, hello, Alex, you're back. Excellent. I'll talk Hi. a little bit about MIT, um, which is to say MIT is, I, I like to joke, is the most organic place I've ever worked. Uh, there are just so many different labs and classes and um, initiatives. And it's, it's a, you, it is unbelievable how much there is going on at any one point. Um, I work for a group that's not sort of part of the um, academic, it's not under the provost, it's, it's, a, it's a separate group. And as such, I get to work across the university um, and work with an unbelievable diverse array of um, faculty and students. And there are real challenges, real challenges and also real strengths to that. Um, and there are days when I feel like, oh, it'd be so nice if we could sort of have everything under one umbrella and, and sort of one uh, and centralized. And I realize on those days that I'm, um, uh, uh, that, I, that I need to uh, take heart that actually this big tent approach that um, really making sure that it's sort of across everywhere and not, and not centralized. In the end, I actually think that's, that's a real, um, a real bonus um, and can give examples of how we, on the one hand have a, you know, we, for undergraduates, you can minor, you can take classes as a graduate student, you can, uh, you know, you can focus this in your research area, you can uh, do a sustainability certificate through Sloan, there's all kinds of things you can do, but that some of the most important things that we're doing are actually the things that if you're taking the general institute requirements that you're required to take a year of physics, you're required to take a year of math, you're required to take these classes. If you can in, in, infuse into those kinds of classes or into, you know, a, a, a good example from a thermodynamics class, that's really where you're going to reach the most students. Um, and that is both the, the, the challenge and the uh, and the vision for where I, for where I think this needs to go. Alex, are you you or with you or you got you? Speaking of challenges, technology is uh, doesn't always cooperate. I wish we could be in person. Um, are, are we still in the first question about the stories or frameworks or models yeah. that we're using? Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm sorry. I was especially interested because um, the, of the way your university uses the sustainability development goals, which is very unusual. 
Yeah, um, and that's why I came here to see how it would work. <laughs> so we're taking a university-wide approach that uh, was launched by the provost. It uses a framework of the sustainable development goals, which if you're not familiar with them, there are a set of 17 wide ranging goals that all countries agreed to in 2015 with the ambitious objective of achieving them by 2030. And they go beyond the you know, environmental definition of sustained sustainability to also include concept concepts of equality and governance. And um, what's really important about this framework is that that underscores the fact that equity is at the heart of sustainability, which is very much in line with Provost Garrett's approach. I mean, we're not starting from scratch. We're building on more than 20 years of an engaged effort of this broader definition of sustainability, but this framework has really given us a grounding for how to think about this moving forward. And we do that by engaging locally in global conversations that countries, city, the private sector, universities, other partners around the world are also advancing. So in practical terms, what this means is that we look at all of our education, research and practice activities and determine how they relate to the goals. So this includes things like working with instructors to incorporate the global goals into their syllabi, establishing in interest group for faculty members, identifying how their research is related to the, goal, uh, to the global goals and um, basically reaching out to the student population to see where their interests already are and making those links to the goals. Because we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We want to enhance and supplement and facilitate connections with different parts of the university to drive this work, recognizing that a lot of it is already happening. This is just, a, as um, you mentioned, Sarah, a, a framework to sort of bring it all together so we can look at it comprehensively. So we published that voluntary university review last year. Um, and you may have noticed throughout the document, you said, this is not comprehensive, we missed things, we understand, especially during the pandemic, that this is hard. But it was really great to go through that process to talk to people about what they were already doing and how it was relevant to get them excited about this and feel that they were, they were doing something that was part of this bigger global agenda. Great. Um, Alex, back to you. I have a question, another follow-up question. So, um, this is unbelievably messy work that we all do. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you run into? Sure, I think one that probably has already been touched on is the many different understandings of sustainability. And we, we talked about that in our previous conversation. Everyone has a different understanding. And at CMU, we're taking this really broad definition of sustainability that includes 17 goals. So that's things like, no hunger, no poverty, peaceful, just, and strong institutions. And getting people to understand how their work is also relevant to sustainability has been a challenge. We've heard from diversity, equity, and inclusion colleagues that when they see the word sustainable development goals, they think this isn't relevant to my work, I'm not going to engage. But of course, that's at the heart of what we, I think what the general definition of sustainability is in particular in terms of um, the sustainable development goals. So what we did was after we launched the initial voluntary university review, we conducted really detailed focus groups with undergraduates, graduates, faculty, and staff to get a better understanding of what their conceptions of sustainability were, where they already were engaging with the sustainable development goals, and what they wanted to see the university to do moving forward. It's still messy, and it's still complicated, but it's a start, and it's, it's an organizing framework, and it's really helpful that a lot of other universities the city of Pittsburgh um, uh, and other countries are also using this framework. So we have people to talk to um, and learn from on how to best do this. I'm going to jump in with what I see as one of the largest challenges. And it's actually something um, that I hadn't thought to talk about initially, but I, I was thinking about last night as I went to look at um, presentations that were developed by students who took a, a course this past summer called Experiential Sustainability. Um, I think that one of the greatest challenges, we, oh, let me actually back up again. Um, uh, I had a children's book as a, young, as a young girl and there was a story in it of a king and, a, 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 and the castle catches fire uh, and the firemen come and they put out the fire and the king says, this is the most important work to be done in this world, look, they saved the castle. I order everybody to be a fireman. So everyone becomes a fireman. And the next week he has a toothache and needs a dentist, but there's no dentist because everyone's a fireman. And two weeks later, he's getting hungry and he wants a baker, 
there's no bread because there's no baker because everyone's a fireman. Uh, and there's, you know, the end of the story. And I, as a kid, I remember thinking this was a really weak story. And then I come here and I realize I can't tell you how often I hear what's the most important thing to do. What's the thing I got to do to fix these problems? Tell me what's the most important thing I need to do. And that's the thing I'll do. That's the thing I'll become. And there's this belief that it, it just, it's an undercurrent of just about everything, which is, you know, if we just focus on X or Y or Z, we're going to fix a lot of these problems in our world without an understanding that we need the firemen, the dentists, the bakers, and, and everybody else. And that we got into this not because we did one big disastrous thing, but because we've done billions of small things over time. And that that's the way we're going to get out of this as well, is by doing billions of things for the next you know, many, many years going forward. Um, and I think that belief, that underlying belief is a real challenge to sustainability education. Pam or Chris, you can jump in. Um, sure, so uh, really great comments uh, that I've heard. Um, and let me just reflect on a, on a few of them. So. Um, to Alex's point, the messiness, I think, is the richness of sustainability. Anytime you're dealing with transformative concepts, they're never going to be simple. And I think this gets to your point as well, Sarah, is that there is no magic bullet. I think people in this, in, who've worked in sustainability seriously for a long time have recognized that, that uh, you, you can't hope to zero in on one dimension and hope that it's going to solve all problems. One of the things that undermines uh, sustainability thinking in practice is the importance of systems thinking and the interactions and connections between uh, our actions and the dynamics that we're a part of and that we contribute to. So um, one of the most important things for me as an educator is to make sure that our students have a really strong sense of how systems function, the dynamics of them, the interactions, uh, making sure that when they take actions that they might have unintended consequences, even if done with the very best of intentions. And then to use that, that systems dynamics to think about how to build interventions that are systems themselves, right? So not single, single points of, of, intervent, of intervention. Yes, we need to be doing billions of things, but we need to be doing those billions of things in a, in a, using a very strong systems framework. I think that's really, really fundamentally important. Well, I, I have to agree with all of you. Um, <laughs> uh, excellent points. Ones that I would make too. I think the whole question about, you know, what is sustainability? And, you know, I've had people say it's a corrupt term. There's so many different definitions. We can't really work on it. But I think there's clearly a common thread through everybody's definition of sustainability. And it includes intra and intergenerational human well being, for which we need, you know, a uh, intact life support system on the planet, a, a natural system. So, I mean, we go round and round on that. that. That is part of the problem. I think a bigger barrier to actually coming together though, is that that in, in some ways leads to different, you know, adjectives, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, economic sustainability, whatever else. And, and that, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, sustainability is about it all. And this goes to the points you guys have made about this, this is a systems problem. And yes, it's wonderful, actually, that, you know, an engineer can come in and decide to focus on, on battery technologies and, and feel like they're making a big contribution to sustainability. And somebody else can be, you know, studying policies and policy interventions that, that make sense. But the only way for those those people to actually get as far as they would they should get in their work is if they're framing their work in a broader context in that in that complex systems co um, context where they realize lots of other things have to be in place and therefore there's value to a whole all of their colleagues around the university who are working on other aspects of it uh, and so getting that i think getting a systems perspective when you go into your work uh, even though you're not going to be working on that whole system, you're recognizing that it's there's all these interactions and linkages and feedbacks and unintended consequences and things that have to happen in order for your intervention, your technology or whatever to be successful. 
So if we could get that sense in, in our universities and across our universities of, you know, we're all, we all have a role to play, but we ought to be understanding a little bit more broadly um, what else is needed. I think we would make a lot more progress a lot more quickly. Well, how do you then teach systems thinking? I think it's, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's something that is, um, it, it can be taught in a relatively simple way because it, it just by providing frameworks or ways for people to be reminded to think about where, <clears throat> where those feedbacks might occur, to be looking for unintended consequences for imagining or and to think systematically about what else is needed, even though you're not doing it. So, you know, I, I, an example would be if there's somebody working on solar cell technology, fantastic. But it, it's useful to think about, okay, what, what are the things that would be needed? Maybe different kind of techno other technologies, maybe different distribution systems, maybe what are the environmental impacts of what resources are needed? What, you know, are the, are the social and cultural barriers to actually having this used, who wins, who loses, um, you know, and so on. So having the ability at some point in one's career to actually think broadly and systematically while you're doing the narrow thing. And so how do you do that? You know, it can be done in a, in a matter, you know, in one course, it could be done in a couple lectures or one lecture. It's amazing. I give lots and lots of systems lectures in other people's classes at Stanford. And the students come back and say, that, that really changed the way I think about this. And you know, it's, it's not a, a complex systems course. They don't have that deep knowledge, but it's a way of thinking. It's a mindset. Um, it's, it changes perspectives a little bit. And I think that's the level where we wanna reach everybody. Um, so I, I, I'd love other people's answers to okay, that question. Can I jump in here just quickly? Um, so I entirely agree with with what Pam is saying, and we do teach courses in systems thinking for students who are in our sustainability degrees, and I'm happy to share um, the details of that if anyone's interested. But what we're finding is that for the students who graduate from our programs and go work for companies or public sector or nonprofit <laughs> sector, they often become the systems thinkers in those organizations. But if we could get other people who are not trained in that to at least understand and appreciate its importance, so, you know, maybe some, maybe students, when they're listening to Pam, pick up on some of those ideas. So when they, when they're, maybe they end up as an accountant working for, you know, a, a financial firm, but if they've got that thinking in the back of their minds, when the sustainability person comes around and starts talking to them about how maybe true cost accounting might be a different way of thinking about how they do their job, at least they're open-minded and willing to have that conversation. So it's that mindset, I think is, is the perfect, perfect term. And and I'll add to that, that, you know, their students have specific expertise, but also at least at CMU using the framework of the sustainable development goals, we're identifying areas where different parts of the university have different expertise and they can work together so we can help improve this, um, this collaboration. So if you have, say, a student in the art department who's really excited about uh, using materials, they can work with someone in our material science department to bring that project together and they each bring their part of the expertise to move the project forward. Um, recognizing that working in a team maybe help, maybe will help everyone achieve their common objective. And then in CMU, we also really focus um, on experiential learning. It's part and parcel of our curriculum. And right now we're working on incorporating the sustainable development goals into those experiential learning courses so that students can better think about the broader impact of what they're doing, even if they're not directly working on it, and then make those connections with other researchers, with professors, with students, and even staff who are interested in, in a similar project. Yeah. Can, can I, I comment? Oh, can I just ahead. comment on that? Because we talked about this before. Now, Alex and I have talked about this before. I think there's huge value in the SDGs as, as a way of thinking, but they were designed to be an integrated whole. And I think one of the biggest problems because this goes against systems thinking, is to take them one by one. You hear a corporation saying, well, you know, we're working on SDG 5 and 12, or, you know, an NGO would do the same. And, and we do that in the university. And, oh, I'm working on SDG 5. You know, that's great. Wonderful. But if we don't ever have a chance to step back and get a systems perspective we're about this complex social biophysical system that we are on in this planet, 
then we can go down the wrong road with the SDGs. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's always that, how do you, how do you shift from thinking about, you know, one or mm -hmm. two to the whole bundle and yeah. realize that's where the feedbacks, interactions, unintended consequences happen. Totally. And, you know, I, I, my favorite term or at least favorite term is rainbow washing. When people slap a bunch of SDG <laughs> icons on their activity and say, look, we're implementing the global goals when actually they've just sort of identified where they're working in something. And so what we're doing is exactly that saying, oh, you're working on, say, you're really passionate about recycling, which is goal 12 on responsible consumption and production. But how is this relevant to all of the other goals? And what's the broader impact of what you have? So if you're not just talking about recycling, but why does it matter to the broad range of goals? And how is it connected to other activities that other people are taking? Um, so I totally agree with you. Like focusing just on one goal uh, also won't help us achieve the global goals because all 17 are interconnected and have to be achieved collectively in order for us to have an impact. Um, but yeah, I cannot stand rainbow washing and definitely particularly uh, private corporations um, are guilty of doing that. Uh, addressing one particular challenge, like maybe they won't wash their sheets as often, but they don't pay their staff a fair wage. So they're not really a sustainable corporation if they're not looking at how to fairly treat their workers, even if they're not washing their sheets every day. I would just add quickly that uh, I love the term rainbow washing. Um, <laughs> what happens when, does it all come out as like kind of a muted brown color when you do that? I don't know. Anyway. It's not pretty. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what I'll add is that it's not only important that people look at all aspects of it from a systems perspective, but it also creates creative opportunities. So when you think, okay, I, I only want to focus on water. If you start to incorporate the goals of the, you know, the other 16 goals, I think it leads to much more creative solutions as well, which to me should be motivating and fulfilling rather than a burden. Yeah, I, I want to build on that, which is that for me, when we start off at the beginning talking about that spectrum, you know, people who are very involved in this and people who are not, to me, the SDG framework is so useful as like the first step to try to get people into, you know, maybe you're not, like you had said, they say to themselves, I'm not interested in sustainable development because I'm not into environment. But when they see that um, issues around gender or issues around poverty or something else that does speak to them in a more direct way, is actually sustainability as well. It's almost like a way in. Um, I don't consider it the end of that journey. I consider it, a, you know, a way to. It's almost like providing us with a with a baseline language that we can talk across different. If people have different interests, we can all sort of point to the ones that we do. And then when you dig a little deeper, uh, you start to recognize all of those all of those connections. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, so uh, we have, uh, um, I, I was thinking of the way systems is, is a couple of different ways that I know it's, it's taught uh, at MIT, both explicitly and implicitly. So first, um, uh, somebody I know who studies geology says the best way to study systems is to study the earth. Like that is the ultimate system. Uh, and that, that is to me what systems thinking is to somebody else who's an epidemiologist and said, if you study the human body, that is the ultimate system. Uh, you have to know every, down to the minutia, the little parts of those atoms and the cells, and that's the ultimate system. So, uh, so to say, a lot of people say, tell me that in their discipline, whatever their discipline is, that's where they study systems thinking, that within, that they're so far, um, have such deep area expertise that they understand the fullness of the system that they study and that that is how they ultimately understand uh, what a system's thinking. That's, that's sort of one, one poster. Second poster child would be um, uh, a program that we have here for first year students. And actually one of the people in the room here is from that program where um, it's, it's a first, uh, first semester course for freshmen. So they have only the context that they're, that they're coming from their high schools with. Um, and they are given a big, messy problem with no, you know, concrete X equals three answer. And um, they start thinking, oh, maybe we can maybe find a technical solution and quickly realize that it, you can't just create a widget and, and solve these problems. And 
by the end of the semester, they have amazing, like unbelievably creative and interesting ideas. But the thing that they come away with most of all is just understanding how complex and how messy this is. And then they take classes and they get all of these frameworks and they get all of these ways to dis definitions and theories about the thing that they experienced. So in other words, they're having the experience first and then they're sort of having, they're being given the tools to analyze what it was that they went through. The third example, third poster is in the School of Business. There's a long tradition, Jay Forrester of system dynamics and uh, modeling. Uh, uh, John Sturman would say uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful, uh, and that really it's about um, modeling, lear learning to really put all of your thoughts in a very objective, um, analytical way out there and testing those theories, not just as a, a thought experiment, but actually uh, in a in a, in a program and a model. So those are different ways of thinking about, about systems at, at this university that I wanted to sort of show. There's so many ways to do this. Uh, uh, and it's unclear to me, how, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you bring this to scale? So that's, that's kind of where I wanted to go with this, which is sort of what is end game here? Um, what are the things that, uh, you know, that graduates need to be able to do and how do we know that they're learning those things and that we're, that we're having success? Can I, can I start with that? But before I ask, answer that question, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I completely love your examples of systems thinking and, and learning systems analysis and systems thinking. Um, but I think for sustainability, we really do need to keep reminding ourselves that we are talking about complex social biophysical systems intertwined as one, not, oh, I'm going to throw in the social stuff somewhere along the line, but realizing that when we're working on sustainability challenges, they are intertwined. We, we uh, as a yeah. social system and the biophysical system are intertwined. Yeah and the environmental system are all together. So what we, what I, I, I just, you know, I just want to keep reminding us of that too. And cause that's a different thing than, you know, taking a little bit of one and a little throwing them together. Um, to your, uh, your, your question about how to scale. <laughs> that is the, that is the ultimate question. And, you know, I love ASU's example because as a university, it has scaled. Um, it, it's an, an incredibly enormous in terms of the number of people that it reaches. So I love Chris's thoughts on this. But um, one of the one of the ways I think we scale is by, you know, using online systems. You know, we uh, we you, we can teach professional education online using systems approaches, systems analysis, teaching that, and and it can reach a lot of different people. We can um, add case studies into courses around the university. And we, we actually, in, in, our, in our sustainability science and practice program, created case studies that can be used in a whole bunch of other courses around sustainability transitions um, and with materials that go with them. That, that's a great way to learn to really think about the complex systems. Um, so I, I think there's just a lot of answers, um, but I think we, we, uh, we somehow need to provide materials that can be shared very broadly huh. and reach more people. And, um, and so, you know, let me just turn it over to Chris to tell the ASU story. Sure, Thank, thanks for the setup, Pam. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we are a large institution, 135,000 students and growing. And uh, that's a very deliberate design um, based on the notion idea that in the 21st century, we need a much larger educated population in order to deal with the sustainability challenges and opportunities that we've been talking about. So it's a kind of core to the, to the mission. And sustainability is a fundamental design principle of the university and has been ever since our president, Michael Crow, arrived in 2002. And Pam, I think you joined our board soon after, right? Um, you, helped think, you helped think through the design of the Global Institute of Sustainability and then later the School of Sustainability. So thank you publicly for doing that. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, we've been talking a lot about systems thinking, but let me just say quickly before I get to the scaling issue, how we organize our curriculum, we do it around the idea of core competencies. 
And this is based on sort of long uh, discussions and conversations about well, what is the key knowledge set that you need to have in sustainability? This comes up over and over and over again. Should you have a grounding in ecology? Should you have a grounding in, in engineering? Should you have a grounding in policy, economics, and so forth? Um, and the answer to those questions is yes, but of course <laughs> you can't, right? We only have one lifetime. And so we reorganized our curriculum around not key knowledge areas, but around core competencies. And I'll go through those quickly. The first is systems thinking as Pam described, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, the integrated socio-ecological technical systems. We need all of our students to be able to understand how those function. The second is what we call future thinking. And that is not necessarily forecasting, but giving students the uh, courage to think about what the future could be, right? So it's through things like scenario planning, uh, or backcasting is another approach that can be used. The third is what we call a normative or values thinking. And that relates to what I just talked about. That's allowing students to think that science doesn't have to be just about the state of how things work, but uh, how things should work. And it also incorporates the, incorporates the idea that people are motivated by values. So why we do things is not just a simple cost benefit uh, ratio. There's lots of reasons why we do things that need to be explained or can be explained better by understanding the values that motivate individuals. Uh, the fourth is what we call uh, strategic thinking. So if we can envision a future that we want and need, um, and also of course, based on notions of ethics, uh, justice and um, inequality, we, if we can envision that better future, what strategies can we put in place? And those can be multiple, right? They can be policy related, they can be technological, they can be social, they can be behavioral. And then lastly is what we call collaborative thinking. And that's based on the idea that no single individual could ever help hope to possess all that's necessary to lead us to this future. And then developing those collaborative skills, not just throwing people in a room and hoping for the best, but actually developing their collaborative skills is a fundamental aspect for sustainability training. So what that allows is that if you use a framework like that, that means that engineering students have a point of entry into working within this framework or students in business do or students in law or public policy. And so it, it doesn't exclude, if so if we said you thou must have a depth in ecology that would exclude a large population from participating in this. Now to the idea of scaling, I'm, I've seen a lot of things happening in the chat around K-12 and we've invested a lot of time thinking about how to integrate sustainability thinking into K-12 education. The last thing that we want, and we saw this early on, is that uh, students were coming and discovering sustainability when they got to college. It shouldn't be a discovery field. It should be something that people know. It should be a mindset. So how do we work with K-12, not to add another subject, but to integrate sustainability thinking as uh, a way to motivate students? Why am I having to learn math? We haven't learned math because this is going to provide you, in sustainability framing, this is going to provide you with an opportunity to think about the future uh, that, that you're going to be, that you're going to be part of. Um, another thing is demonstrating their career pathways. And there are a lot of career pathways. Uh, I see more and more jobs that are looking for the kinds of skills that we've been talking about. And then finally, lifelong learning. How do universities and their partners participate in lifelong er learning opportunities so that individuals, maybe they've gained a lot of wisdom in a particular field. I think about how to integrate that into a broader systems perspective related to sustainability and sustainable development goals. Sorry for the long response, but something we thought about. Uh, a <laughs> well, oh, sorry. And also just before Alex, I wanted to hear from you, but I dropped into the chat while you were talking and I can do it again if you like, that link to the page, the, the core competencies that Chris was speaking to. Um, there was a, a article uh, in 2011, but recently updated in uh, 2020. And so there's a link to it there, key competencies in sustainability higher education towards an agreed upon um, reference framework. So, and, and the core competencies that Chris was speaking to are, are described in there. So, Alex. Sure, well, this is sort of part and part, part of the reason that we decided to conduct the voluntary university review was to get this big picture of where we were in terms of sustainability in education, in research, in practice. And the first one that we published last year was very static. It's one simple report that maps one activity to one goal, uh, but it was a start. It was a start of a conversation to get people thinking about this across our seven different colleges. We have colleges ranging from arts to computer science, to the humanities, to public policy and engineering. 
Um, so the first step is simply understanding where we are and, and acknowledging that we as CMU don't have to address all 17 goals and all aspects of sustainability, but where are our strengths and where are our weaknesses and maybe what can we do to address them? So I'm very excited because this year and, and next month we'll be publishing an app developed by a student that shows how all courses at CMU from fall 2019 to the present are related to each of the goals, mentioning Pamela that they're not just related to one or two, but to every single one, if they are, it's gonna be an interactive site so that students can go and find topics that they're interested in that may not be in their college or university that they can take part in. We're doing the same thing with our faculty research pages. Um, we're working with a set of early adopters who are excited about um, working across the various um, aspects of sustainability to share what they're doing and work with other interested and like-minded groups to sort of develop a, an interest group of people who wanna move this forward. So I think the challenge, at least with the sustainable development goals, it can be very top-down. These are the goals. It was agreed at the UN, so on and so forth. But you still need that bottom-up excitement and interest in people to be advocates for um, this type of education and this approach in order for it to work and for them to get other people excited about it. So that's sort of how we're doing it from the top down understanding with the voluntary university review and the engagement with students, faculty and staff to better understand what their needs are and how we can address them moving forward. So we'd like to Hi. open this. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I want to come back to the competencies because it is really, really important. And uh, both of you guys, uh, you and Chris uh, articulated why. And it is a really important part of scaling. Um, but that, that goes back to this, this range of different kinds of programs we teach. And, and I really do think it's important also, the competencies go everywhere. That's excellent. But in addition, you know, asking the question, at least in some of our pro programs in our universities, sometimes I think about it as the new MBA program. You know, the, the question is, how do we develop change agents for sustainability? So it's not what are, you know, what do they need to be taught, but how do we develop, help that person develop as a change agent with the right, with the identity and perspectives and the competencies and the agency to really drive change? Um, and if we, if we are able to help develop that kind of leader and they leave our universities, they're going to have a tremendous impact all around the world. And so I think it's, it's really important also. And that, you know, that takes real design thinking, you know, that takes a real design process to, uh, and in a, a complicated, maybe one, um, to, to recreate that kind of program. And I hope that our universities are all doing that too, actually reaching out on, you know, trying to understand what it's going to take to prepare leaders to, you know, radically accelerate a transition to sustainability. And it takes input from people outside the university as well as in. It's, um, you know, we need to listen to corporate, non-governmental, NGO, you know, governmental leaders, um, as well as academics. And and uh, we, we need to develop a vision for that and then a curriculum. And we've done that in one of our programs and are doing it in others. And it's, it changes what the program is by starting with that yeah. question, what does it take? Um, so um, I have my colleagues to thank for that, but it's a great example of, of really articulating that, that vision and figuring out what it takes to lead to that vision. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so Pam, I'm sorry, I just want to add quickly to that. I, I think one of the most fundamental lessons uh, and, and um, mindsets that we can provide our students is that they don't have to accept the status quo, that change is possible and they can be part of the change. Lead the change. Like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then there's leadership training that can be associated with that. Experiential learning, I think, is a really great way to, to be able to demonstra demonstrate that and motivate students. But that idea that that change and that improvement, making things better, the things that are fair and just is possible, that students have agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to open this up to the larger uh, audience of uh, 80 some people that we have here uh, and, the, and the people in the room, um, if they wanted to ask questions uh, directly to us or contribute to the conversation. Uh, if you're interested, if you have something to say, just you can put it in the in the uh, Q and A. You see, there's a long. Oh, 
Oh boy, there's a lot in the chat. And they're opening up. See, there's a couple of us in the room all spread around. <laughs> Hello, all of us wearing our masks. We said, I, we said we're trying new things and, you know, and, and just try, figuring it out. It was important to me to try to make this hybrid if for no other reason, because we can try to make it hybrid <laughs> <laughs> and have, try to have an experience where there are other people in the room with us, so. Hi, uh, this, this is Paulo from Argentina. Uh, I Hi, have a question. thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, to share with you that I've been doing several uh, climate change and system dynamic workshops in a university from Argentina with tools from MIT and Climate Interactive and Broads. Yes. Uh, and by doing these workshops, I've seen that the university has no institutional approach to sustainable development and the role that a university uh, should have in this sense. So my, my question was, how do we start? How, how, how should I help the beginning of this journey in this university? I'm going to make a shameless plug for um, uh, climate interactive tools. I just put a link in the chat. So uh, you're describing the En-ROADS uh, uh, simulation. That's a tool that I've been using uh, and it has a tremendous success. But by doing that, I've seen that the university as a whole has not a general and institutional approach to, to sustainable development. So I, I was wondering uh, and ask you uh, that you have more experience, how should we start? How a university should start the, uh, this road of, of being a leader in sustainable development and teaching that to the, to the students? I have I have one suggestion for starting. I think it's a great question. You know, how do you how do you go from nothing where everybody's doing their own thing to having a conversation at least that that then can lead to institutional change? And um, this is not, not terribly uh, helpful, perhaps, but you know, simply starting by trying to build the community, uh, identifying the others in different parts of the of the uh, university who have interests, uh, who care about sustainability challenges and bringing them together. I mean, one thing, it depends on your university leadership, uh, how easy that is, because if your university leadership is willing um, to, to encourage a group of faculty or staff or students to get together and, and, and begin a conversation, that builds a community. And once you have the community, once you have enough people wanting to work together you can take the next step and then the next step after that. So it's, it, it's not gonna be all at once, but um, I, you know, with, with most sustainability things, it's sort of engaging in the community um, and, and working together towards it. So I would, that's the approach I would take. And if I go back to the 1990s at Stanford, that is, we, we did that. We built a community of people um, and, and uh, eventually it became the provost you know, committee on environment and eventually the provost committee on sustainability. But it started out with a, a bunch of faculty who really cared talking and working together and who could take that up um, to higher levels in the university over time. Yeah, I, I yeah, would I, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Alex. No, just to echo what Pam said, like by identifying early champions, I mentioned we adopted um, the sustainable development goals in 2019, but CMU has been working on this for more than 20 years because of interested staff, faculty, and students. Um, so it took that time for this to become a leadership initiative. Now we have our provost who is leading on this, establishing a sustainability steering committee that includes people from across campus, Dave Dezombach, who heads our civil environmental engineering program, Sarah Mendelson, a former US ambassador to the UN and our university engineer, an advisory council. So now we're involving more and more different parts of the university to make it happen. But it starts with just talking to people who share your passion. I was gonna say that eventually this has to get to the leadership level because sustainability needs to engage everybody. So at some point you need to convince leadership. Now, you, if, if you're fortunate and you get a leader who comes in and already believes it, that I think is ideal, but I know that's not often the case. So again, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. There's not no, silver bullet, right? And much like sustainability. 
So I think you need to be able to do multiple things simultaneously. One is to engage students and to demonstrate that their student interest in doing this kind of work and, and, uh, and, and learning about sustainability and how it, can, how it can apply to what they're studying and what their career goals are and what their life goals are. I think the other is uh, pointing to other examples of working examples that uh, around the, the world, what universities have adopted this and the benefits that they've accrued from it. There's a, a vast and growing literature. Uh, an external advisory board, I think would be another approach as well, where you can get people who can come in and, and talk to leadership and students, faculty, staff, and friends about the value that this can bring and how transformative it, it, it can be to institutions. Um, if you can get a donor, uh, that's also helpful too. Uh, so um, <laughs> we were fortunate in our case in, in getting a very generous donor who uh, brought a lot of attention. Not, it was, resources are wonderful, but it wasn't that so much. It was more that an external a person who was external to the university believed in what we were doing. So again, I think it, it, it can't be like one, one thing. Maybe you start with one thing, but I think you need to take, it, take a systems perspective and thinking about how to, to build up support. I do have to say that point about students is really important. Everything else that you said too, Chris, absolutely uh, agree with. But the but but having students speak and and learn in that process that they have a voice, they what they what they think matters, uh, that drives change in faculty and it also ch it changes the institution uh, as a whole. Um, and then you know then you get later on into the conversations about how could you organize your institution to work more effectively towards sustainability, but that's way down the road. Early on, I agree that both getting the faculty and staff together and getting the students to speak is great. Well, you know, in my experience, courses and curricula have staying power, right? More so than task force or, you know, special working groups and so forth. If you're committed to teaching a class, you know, three days a week, you've got to be there. It's not something you can put off to the end of the semester or, you know, during downtime. So I, I think it helps to build it into the infrastructure of the institution when you, when you bake it into curriculum or teaching or, or other uh, student experiences. The other thing that is important there, and I think it would be an interesting question for you, um, is, if, is whether or not the operational part of your university has thought about sustainability. There are so many things that universities are doing that saves money and, you know, just makes sense for, for the university's, you know, near-term well-being, but also for the long-term. And if we, you can eventually have a, a combination of the students calling for and demanding more interest, you know, more effort in the area, the operational side of the university, you know, improving the energy use efficiency or water use or even those or first steps and there are a lot of other ones and then the faculty engaged who even if it's just a relatively small number who are engaging in research and teaching in the area um, that that's powerful and I love there's lots of examples now of universities where those three parts are are coming together doing strategic planning together um, you know thinking about the whole university um, and so I guess that's a place to aim, but there might be yeah. partners in those other areas too. And that's exactly why our voluntary university review includes practice, which focuses on university policies, not just in terms of um, green practices, but also our human resources policies, our equity policies to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion for students, faculty, and staff, um, is, uh, programs to address hunger and things like that. The, the voluntary university review takes us all, puts it in one place so people better understand how all of these different bits fit, fit together and where we can maybe do better in terms of our practice for the university, in addition to the education research that we've been talking about today. Uh, there's two more questions. I know there's only a minute left, but I wanted to know if we could maybe squeeze them in, if that's okay. I think there, there are two people on deck. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, my name is Jessica Kadaro. I am a K-12 educator at a cyber school in Pennsylvania, and I'm also working on my EDD in educational sustainability. I would like to focus my work on um, incorporating sustainability into programs in K-12. Um, you were mentioning that 
many times and see students coming to, or you would hate to see students coming to higher ed without any knowledge of sustainability. I was wondering, do you see many students coming into higher ed with no or minimal background knowledge in sustainable practices? I can't answer that very fully, um, but I can tell you that I am getting a lot more um, both cl clear knowledge and interest in the freshmen coming into our university. And yeah. I'm getting lots and lots of emails. <laughs> Personally, I'm getting emails from, from K-12 students, you know, fifth graders around the, around the country asking for, you know, a conversation about this, so which, which I usually can't do, but it's wonderful. So something's changing. Uh, and I, but I have not done an analysis to figure out exactly what. Maybe someone else here has. Yeah, well, I haven't done an analysis, but I, I would um, agree with your assessment that there seems to be growing interest in this. This, this generation gets it. Uh, they know that it's something that will affect them in their lifetimes, especially climate change. And so they're very interested. Um, Jessica, I also wanted to bring your attention to we're working on a project that will hopefully be launched uh, within the next year where we're going to be bringing um, curriculum and materials and, and organizing for uh, high school uh, community college and introductory university uh, sustainability education in STEM. So this idea of you have your teaching physics and we'd like you to bring sustainability to your physics class, your math class, your chemistry class. Um, uh, and you know, there's a scales project that is in the works that MIT will be sharing broadly um, with, uh, with these, with these, class, with these um, grades in the US. So thank you. There's one more question. We're a minute over time, so I'm going to squeeze this in. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, so my name is Richard Sebastian, and I work uh, with uh, for a nonprofit that works with community colleges across the country, and I um, also work with uh, open educational resources and promoting that. And, you know, many of the, the, the universities represented here today have been leading on openly licensing course material uh, in order to uh, enable sharing. And I'm, I'm wondering if that... Do you see that as uh, kind of uh, a way of, um, you know, putting open licensing on these kind of sustainability solutions on curricula as a way of really helping uh, scale uh, these solutions uh, so that other students or universities or colleges could could adopt them and and you know, uh, and much uh, much more quickly. Uh, rather than doing the not invented here stuff, right, and and um, and keeping uh, stuff uh, within kind of individual colleges and universities. Thank you. Yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So, thank you for joining us. Um, I, this has been uh, brought to you by uh, the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. Uh, well, this is part of our People, Planet, and Prosperity series, and we will be having other such um, panels coming up. Hopefully, the next one will be in November. Stay tuned for information. Thank you to Chris, and thank you to Pam, and thank you for Alex. Not only has this been a good conversation, but in the preparation, the weeks leading up to this, it's really been a pleasure uh, working with you, and I really appreciate your thoughts, uh, your insights. And I really hope that we can continue to, to work together. I know that we had discussed this um, previously. We are offering to anybody who, who's part of this call, please contact us. Uh, if you can, you know, you can put my email in the chat. Uh, Chris can do the same. You can find Pam, you can find Alex. You can find us, it's not hard to find us. And if you're interested in, um, uh, in furthering this conversation and in figuring out what works in your school, what have you tried, what do you recommend, please reach out to us. We think that the best way of really building a movement is by working together. So thank you very much. I'm sorry we're four minutes over. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. And great. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye -bye.